Hey, thanks for joining me for my summer book study on the incredible Catholic Mass. This is part two. We're looking at chapter three and four. So let's ask uh, the Lord to bless us in our, our time together today. Let us pray. Lord, please send the Holy Spirit upon us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, help us to know and love the Mass better and to live the mysteries of the Mass in our lives more fruitfully. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if uh, you're just joining me, um, don't worry, we'll get you caught up quick. Um, this uh, this book by uh, Father Martin von Kochum, The Incredible Catholic Mass, it's, um, I gotta tell you, the, the more I, I spend time with it, the more I um, see so many things in it which um, are really pretty timeless, and some things I think you'll see today which uh, actually in the 19th and 20th century uh, were really sort of rediscovered in uh, different circles of Catholic theology and have become really important for us. And especially were highlighted in this book right here, The Catechism of the Catholic Church. I've had some comments already that the, the, the tone of the book and style of the book maybe is a little bit different. It can sometimes have sort of a polemical style, which you could say is probably uh, fallen on hard times. It's not really uh, in favor now unless you like to watch cable TV. But what I want you to see, um, and I'm going to be at pains, I think, to show there's so much happening here, which is um, it's extremely imp important for understanding the timelessness of the mystery of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and the Mass. Uh, but, but as I said, things that which also um, the church has actually kind of been rediscovering in the last, oh, say, 100 to 150 years. So in the first two chapters, we looked at the mystery of the Mass as a sacrifice, and if you didn't see that, watch the watch for the part one. But now in chapter three, we're taking a look at, you might say, what participation in the sacrifice of the mass um, does. We'll, and we'll look at it in this chapter through Old Testament types or foreshadowings uh, of the of that sacrifice, of the sacrifice of mass. We'll look at Old Testament sacrifices. And then in this chapter, we'll also take a look at the effects, or you might say the fruits of participating in that uh, sacrifice. What does it lead to? Namely, certain uh, mysteries, which we will get into, okay? Um, so take a look at page um, 49. Notice the chapter heading here too is the mysteries of Holy Mass. And we'll hear St. Bonaventure say on page 49 of this book, he quotes St. Bonaventure, uh, 13th century uh, Franciscan. The Holy Mass is as full of mysteries as the ocean is full of drops, or as the sky is full of stars, and as the courts of heaven are, are full of angels. For in it so many mysteries are daily performed that I should be at a loss to say whether greater or more lofty wonders have ever been accomplished by divine omnipotence. Okay, that word mystery, what comes to mind when you hear it? You may think maybe a murder mystery. And if you're thinking along those lines, you're not really going in the right direction because in that sense, a mystery is something which is um, like, a, like a problem that needs to be solved, information that we don't have. And once we you know, look in the right places, we'll get, we'll get the information. That's not exactly what the word mystery means in this uh, sense, in a liturgical sense, in a Christian sense. The, the word mystery always goes um, in Catholic theology, it's, it's like a pair with the word sacrament. So um, a sacrament refers to a, an outward uh, sign. It, when it's used technically, it, it means what you can see or have access to through your senses. Something tangible uh, or audible, touchable, smellable, tasteable. The mystery is that which is not accessible to the senses. You might say underneath or available through the um, sensible uh, sign. And it stands in that sense more for something which is um, so filled with meaning, truth, that it, um, it, it there's an overwhelming quality to it. So the, it's related to the word in Greek, mueo. In Greek, just it's where we get the word mute from. It means you're in, the, in the, it's, you can't speak in the presence of it, not because uh, it's simply hidden, but because it's so super saturated with like a super abundance of, of beauty, truth, power, 
um, presence, uh, et cetera. For example, like the way that uh, if an owl goes out into the light, it, it's, it's overwhelmed with the abundance of light. So that's more like the sense of mystery and sacrament. These supernatural mysteries of God himself, which are um, hidden or accessible through sensible realities, but nonetheless are overwhelming in their awesomeness. So it's, it, they're concealed. These mysteries are concealed by the sacrament, by the sign, but they're also revealed. So keep that in mind as we move through it, because you're gonna you're gonna hear a lot of that in this uh, in in the whole book actually in the word uh, mystery, and that word actually was really reclaimed as opposed to just sacraments, and especially in the 19th century by a famous uh, theologian named Matthias Schaben wrote a very famous book called the Mysteries of Christianity, and then you see it very much in the Catechism in the 20th century it shows up very much in a reclaiming of the expression Paschal mystery. And you might say, well, what's the big deal about that? So for a long time, there was a real focus on, say, mere outward expressions like ceremonies, Paschal ceremonies. Like you read the Old Testament, you've got these things that God tells Moses to tell the people to do for the Paschal ceremonies. You know, get the lamb, do this, do that. Um, but even then, there was a sense in which there's this divine mystery at work in and through the ceremonies or the visible sacramenta. So that's sort of reclaimed in the 19th and 20th century that you get this. It's just part of what, uh, it's just part of, you might say, the, the um, it's called the divine economy or the sacramental economy that God reveals mysteries about himself through the visible world in the Old Testament. And then finally, in, above all, in, the, in Christ himself and in the, in the nature of the, um, the church and her sacraments. Okay, so that's a little overview of that. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, flip with me now with that duality between sacrament and mystery in mind take a look at uh, um, page 50. so now we're, what we're going to see here is he's going to say the mass is full of these my, uh, mysteria or mysteries um, just to make it more confusing by the way the sacraments in greek are called mysteries in latin they're called sacramenta it's a question of emphasis in latin we tend to emphasize the outward expression or the, the efficacious sign. In Greek, we tend to em emphasize, or in the Eastern side of the church, we tend to emphasize the invisible or hidden mysteria, mystery. But you always have both. You have an invisible mystery. You have uh, a visible outward element too. Okay, just loving little story I like on page 50 and 51. <clears throat> I want to try to contextualize it in what I just set up there. It's the story of this man of St. John of Facundo, uh, an Augustinian priest, and he... He got in trouble with his uh, his religious superiors because he would say mass so slow. And um, the, the brothers that be were the, with him at mass, serving the mass, they would just get tired and exhausted of his super slow saying of the mass. And he would um, he would leave. His superiors say, you need to speed it up. But then he eventually tell. But, so that at that point, it sounds like kind of a nice, pious uh, story and um and you might say, well, you know, don't these people like have jobs to get to, you know, like I'm sure I would get in trouble if it took me three hours to say daily mass or people would just stop coming. Um, so at that point, you know, it's kind of just like a nice pious story about this priest who's just, you know, really into what he's doing. And if, if we just left it there, the story wouldn't be uh, probably worth that much other than just saying this guy is, uh, has an ex in a particular extraordinary piety when it comes to the mass. But fast forward to the end of the story and then the, the prior talks with this, this priest and the priest tells him why he says mass so slowly. And he says, because God reveals to him the profound mysteries that are accomplished in the mass, mysteries so sublime that no human intelligence is capable of grasping them. The secrets he dis disclosed to me uh, concerning them were of such a tremendous nature that I was overwhelmed with awe and almost swooned. Christ himself would uh, appear and speak and these, these kind of uh, miracles. Keep in mind what I said about the sacrament and the mystery. So what this young man is experiencing, something which is truly extraordinary and not normal, but it's like a glimpse through the sacramental veils, through all the things accessible to the senses. Um, you might say the uh, ceremonial aspects. And he sees this other world present there. The, and Christ himself is speaking to him. And he's experiencing that sort of without the sacrament, uh, sacramental veil. Now, 
that's not normal. It's almost on the same lines as like a Eucharistic miracle where the Eucharist uh, takes on a different form as opposed to bread and wine, like real blood or a cardiac tissue or a little tiny child Jesus or something. See, these things are extraordinary things which are pointing to that there are there are real mystery or mysteries or mysteria behind the sacraments or sacramenta. Um, okay. So that's going to be the kind of the game that we're playing here for the, for the, really for the next several chapters. He's going to be looking at what are those um, mysteria or these mysteries that are, are present in there. And he's going to get about, we're going to get those access to those mysteries in two ways. One, by looking at Old Testament types. Secondly, by looking at um, the liturgy itself and how it's connected to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, namely his, his whole life, but above all, his paschal uh, mystery. On page 52, he's going to go through, I think, five of the key types. A couple things about types or typology. Tupos is the word in Greek. Think of prototype or prototupos. It means the, uh, uh, a thing which comes first, which anticipates or highlights what's coming later. It happens in, in um, literature all the time, right? Foreshadowing. Well, God himself does that. And he, he foreshadows what he's going to do in his beloved son, specifically in his um, act of redemption of us on the cross and resurrection, and how he's going to make this sacrifice accessible to us in all places and all time, like we saw in part one, from east to west, where the sacrifice will actually be somehow accessed um, on altars as a, as a kind of religious um, experience, for lack of a better word, um, in all places and all times. And these types are first able who's um, killed by his brother uh, Cain, but offers an acceptable sacrifice um, both from his flock, but also his his unjust death somehow is an acceptable, an acceptable sacrifice, killed by his own brother in envious rage. Secondly, Noah, page 53, it says no way there, but sometimes in these older books in the English says uh, no way, it's, but the word is the same. What I want you to see there, it's Noah um, offers a sacrifice when he comes um, off of the ark and that sacrifice, but that also is linked to the whole experience of building the ark and bringing all the animals on board. Um, seven pairs of clean animals, two pairs of unclean animals. So he's overcoming the waters of chaos and somehow his sacrifice makes the world a habitable place again, a new creation. So the third one is going to be Abraham who offers the sacrifice of his own beloved son, but replaces it with this ram and predicts that God is going to send a um, lamb. Um, and then the fourth uh, type or prototype is Melchizedek, who after this great victory offers the sacrifice of bread and wine. And then finally, Aaron, or um, from in the Mosaic law, um, offers three kinds of sacrifice, burnt offerings, peace offerings, and sin offerings, and 54. So if you want to kind of sum all, sum all that all together, these are foreshadowings that God is going to make a new sacrifice accessible, which is going to involve um, an acceptable sacrifice from a beloved son, like Abel. It's going to involve an unjust killing, like with Cain. It's going to make the world inhabitable again for all creation, through like Noah. It's going to involve a father offering his son like Abraham and Isaac. It's going to revolve, it's going to involve um, the sacrifice of bread and wine after a great victory like Melchizedek. And it's going to involve um, a kind of total self offering like a burnt offering, you burn the whole animal, a peace offering, one which brings shalom, which Jesus uh, says when he rises from the dead. It's going to restore the relationship between Israel and God. And then a sin offering, one that takes away the guilt of sin, takes away the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the damage done by sin. That's what expiation does and, and um, unites um, God to his people again, atonement. But what's interesting about what Father von Kochum does here is he highlights three, which he says are actually kind of the most important, Abel, Abraham, and Melchizedek. And he does that for a liturgical reason. This is called liturgical catechesis, where you look at the prayers themselves in order to understand what they mean. And it's in what we call sometimes the Eucharistic prayer number one. It's also called the Roman canon. 
On the bottom of page 54, he, he quotes the prayer that we say in the Roman canon. It's the Eucharistic prayer where he, he where it mentions Abel specifically, Abraham second, and then Melchizedek. A-A-M, Abel, Abraham, Melchizedek, which, it, which actually is the biblical order of it too in terms of chronology. Um, okay. You, we can ask ourselves the question, well, why are those three mentioned specifically? Well, um, he'll go into that on page 55, why he thinks that those three have a particular uh, role. I highlight maybe one rule of typology is, is, is while there's, there's always, typology always means there's some kind of similarity between the old, the, the shadow, and then the reality it signifies and anticipates. But there's another rule too. Not, there's, there's not just similarity and some dissimilarity. There's also an exceeding quality in the reality versus the, what, the shadow that precedes it. And that's what he, he points out here. He goes in the middle of page 55. Um, let's see if I get this right here. Well, yeah, he points out that the, the, it, the sacred body and blood of Christ offered to God the Father is far more pleasing than the animals or the bread and wine offered by him by the patriarchs of old. It must, however, by no means be overlooked that the priest does not beseech God Almighty to look propitiously upon the victim he is offering, because that which he offers to him, Jesus Christ, his well-beloved son, is incomparably more precious in his sight than any created being. What, he, what he's saying there, think of the words in the prayers when the priest at Mass is saying, you know, Father, graciously accept this oblation, um, look on this with a kindly uh, count, uh, countenance and accept it, make, it, make this acceptable to you, spiritual and acceptable. What's going on there? Why would, the, why would the priest be begging God the Father to accept Jesus? Isn't Jesus acceptable to the Father already as he's kind of represented in this sacramental way? What he, what he says there, and this is like a subtle point, but an important one. He says, all that the priest asks of God is he will graciously accept the, this sacrifice the way and manner in which he offers it. In other words, the devotion with which he celebrates Mass. So the distinction there isn't so much what's being offered, Christ himself, the whole Christ, but how it's being sacrificed. In other words, with respect to the priest's participation and these people in this place and this time, that's what's a, a question. It's, it's my participation and yours in the sacrifice. It's not, oh, I hope, I hope Jesus is gonna be acceptable to God the Father this morning, this Sunday morning. That's not what he's doing. Jesus is always acceptable to the Father. Um, but Jesus incorporates the priest and the people in the sacrifice and the prayer is saying, conform us to the acceptability that, that Jesus has by nature, conform that to us through our um, unbloody participation in the sacrifice, okay? Great. Um, this is gonna be a key point for the, the next several chapters. Look at the bottom of page 55 and he says, in regard to the mysteries of Holy Mass, it must above all be born in mind that the principal mysteries of our Lord's life and passion are represented and set before us in it. And he, he quotes some of the Psalms and other parts of the, um, yeah, the Old Testament here. Now, if you're not a Catholic or if you are not familiar with like biblical typology and some basic concepts, you're going to have no idea what he's talking about here. It's going to sound almost like a, like a weird allegory or maybe just some kind of weird wishful projection or a kind of like a liturgical drama that's just um that's kind of pathetic and sort of wishful thinking what's he talking about here it's a deeply biblical idea and to give you a sense of what we're talking about here we're going to go to the catechism of the catholic church and let me point out to you uh some key things here so in the um the catechism i'm going to go to um 1099 and the two key words that are going to help you understand the the biblical uh, and theological background to this, uh, the two words are epiclesis and anamnesis. Anam epiclesis refers to the calling down of the Holy Spirit. Anamnesis is the word for memorial. It's the word Jesus himself uses when he says, do this in memory of me. It's where you get the word um, amnesia. It's related to the word memory. So the calling down of the Holy Spirit is being related to a specific kind of anamnetic event, which is related to remembering something. So let's look at 1099 of the Catechism here, and here it is. 
The Spirit and the church cooperate to manifest Christ and his work of salvation in the liturgy. Primarily in the Eucharist and by analogy in the other sacraments, the liturgy is the memorial of the mystery of salvation. And the Holy Spirit is the church's living memory. Marvelous. The Holy Spirit is the church's living memory. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. Like your spirit is the spirit of you. It's that which by which you, you, you know, it gathers up your whole identity through remembering who you are in, every, in the, your whole experience today and in the past. The spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, is Christ's memory. Therefore, it's, it's what animates the church. It's what makes him present. It's what animates his whole life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And it's what's called down to remember uh, in the liturgy. You follow that? So if you have your catechism, if, if you think I'm just making this up, the importance of those two words, look at 1105 and 1106. The epiclesis is begging the Father to send the Holy Spirit. And then 1106 Together, the anamnesis, the epiclesis, is at the heart of the sacramental celebration, especially uh, the Eucharist. So that's just how it works. I mean, this wasn't invented in the New Testament. It happens even in the Old, in the old Covenant first Passover, where um, it's God who is remembering the Old Passover and making present in the sacrifice, you know, in the centuries and decades after the first Passover— it's in the, the ritual memorial, what, what God calls a perpetual um, institution of the Passover. Um, it's in the sacrifice of those new lambs and eating this new unleavened bread and doing this, this, these sacraments that the mystery of the first Passover, that liberation from Egypt, is made present. Now, it's not the full anamnesis that you see in the, old, uh, in the New Testament, but it's certainly um, foreshadowed there. So it's not simply brand new. What, as you go forward in the book, Father von Kochum is going to be talking about how these mysteries of the life of Christ are made present, his, his incarnation, his nativity, and so on and so forth. If, if you want to see kind of ha- the, the, the theological idea behind that, again, with the catechism, take a look at 1085 of the catechism. This is a section on the liturgy. And he says this, In the liturgy of the church, it is principally his own paschal mystery that Christ signifies and makes present. So Christ, primary agent of the liturgy, he's signifying it and making it present. That's exactly what we're talking about with anamnesis and epiclesis. Um, Good. During his earthly life, Jesus announced his paschal mystery by his teaching and anticipated it by his actions. When is that, like, for example, like where? How about um, at the wedding at Cana? Jesus is anticipating the pouring out of his blood, like as he literally pours out wine, um, anticipates his self-offering, which is also a nuptial experience. On the cross, he's offering himself to his bridegroom and it's fruitful, behold your son, right? So he anticipates that at the wedding at Cana. And he does it many, many, many times. Think of the transfiguration. He anticipates his resurrection. He speaks of his cross. Okay, When his hour comes, he lives out the unique event of history which does not pass away. Jesus dies, is buried, rises from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father once for all. Suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. His paschal mystery is a real event that occurred in history. It's not just a symbol. It's not just some mythological idea. It's an event that happened in history once for all. It's not repeated ever. His paschal mystery is a real event, but it's unique. All other historical events happen once, and then they pass away, swallowed up in the past. The Paschal Mystery of Christ, by contrast, cannot remain only in the past because by his death he destroyed death and all that Christ is, all that he did and suffered for men, participates in the divine eternity and so transcends all times while being made present in them all. The event of the cross and resurrection abides and draws everything towards eternal life. So the uniqueness of the event of Christ. Remember in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, this is my hour, this is my hour, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And that event didn't just happen once and pass away, just drifting away on the river of time. The word abide means to remain. It's by virtue of Jesus's divine identity that his earthly life, especially the Paschal mystery, participates in the divine eternity, which will make it accessible through the spirit of Christ in the sacraments and liturgy of the church. You got that? You can see that in those first few Bible quotes too, by the way, in, in the Yvonne Cochin book that I was mentioning there. But this is laying out kind of in theological 
and some philosophical language, what Father von Kochum is, is, uh, is kind of presuming that you're already sort of familiar with as he says, okay, this event now is made present. This event is made present. This, this mystery of Christ's life is made present. Every, every event of Christ's life on a human level is a mystery of God. It reveals something about God because he is both God and man. Good stuff, huh? Do we need a break? Are you doing okay? If you need a break, just hit the pause button. It's a video. Okay, so back to Von Kochen. Excellent. Okay. So he doesn't use the word anamnesis like we see it in the catechism. Again, let's, that's kind of rediscovered in terms of uh, the Bible and study of Greek and that kind of thing um, in the centuries after he, he wrote this. Um, but on page 56, I think you can see it pointed to. Uh, in the middle, he says, do this in commemoration of me. Again, that's the word anamnesis. Just as, just as if he would say, since the time is now approaching when after accomplishing the redemption of mankind, I shall leave you and go to my heavenly father. I institute the Holy Mass as the one sacrifice of the New Testament, wherein all the mysteries of my whole life and of my passion are represented and placed before the eyes of all believers in order that you may not forget me, but have me ever in your remembrance. In other words, if you don't have a time machine, how are you going to access these mysteries and experience the effects or the fruits of them? And it's through what he institutes as a perpetual um, uh, as a perpetual sacrifice in the life of the church. And remember, having me in your remembrance, you could say, well, couldn't you just have a photograph or isn't the Bible enough just to remember Jesus? It's not remembering in the mere intellectual calling to mind kind of way. It's in that, that uh, epicletic way that I was, we're talking about in the catechism there. It's so that the event which abides is made present uh, through our sign. It's made present through various signs and symbols. And then the fruits of that are made available to those who are participating. Great. Um, by the way, if you're wondering if that's kind of a weird thing, Thomas Aquinas would say uh, it's proper to human beings because we're not angels. If we were just angels, God can, can just, could just flash these mysteries to us and make us participate in them just simply through our souls. And I guess he could do that if he wanted to. But since we're embodied souls, it's through our senses and in communion with each other that it's appropriate for them to be, for them to be, um, appropriated that way. Okay, well, man, I just I should just fast forward uh, to the end here. Uh, towards the end of this, go up to page 59, and um, uh, let's see. What we want to see on the bottom of page 58, he's going to speak about the importance of faith. The higher and more incomprehens incomprehens incomprehensible are these mysteries, the more meritorious is our faith, and the greater will our reward be in heaven. So the sacrament of the Catholic Church uh, in the section on the sacraments says that they're all sacraments of faith because the mystery is signified and revealed but also concealed behind the sacramental uh, tangible reality. It, it requires trust. It requires trust. For example, in the Eucharist, you, don't, you, you see the appearances of bread and wine. You don't see the um, Christ's human or glorified body. So it always requires trust. And the higher the mystery, the greater the... Um, trust which is required. He asks this question, why would our Savior, why does, does it make sense that for Jesus to be with us, like the mystery of him in person, to be with us? Why can't he just be gone and we have to just wait for him to come back in, in glory and kind of slog our way through life? And he says, well, for one reason is because he's head of the, the body of the church. So that's the principle of life. He has to be with us as head, even though he's glorified in heaven, he's still with us in his church because for a body to be living, it has to be connected to the head. That's a great, great little argument, isn't it? Because um, his body is alive. The church is alive. And so he must be present to her as head. Secondly, connected to that, he says, because Christ is the bridegroom. Um, great analogy there, right? Lovely, because once the groom gets married to the bride, he stays with her. He's bodily with her. Where she goes, he goes. And where he goes, she goes. It's proper to love to remain with the beloved. So it's not just a life-giving principle, it's also a love-giving principle. He cannot bear to be separated from her, it says on page 60, wonderful. And then his third reason here, you might say is um, a reason of benevolence, because he wants to provide for her. He gives her life, he stays present with her, and then everything she needs, he wants to, uh, to give her, providing all that uh, she needs, her safety, her welfare, her sustenance. Uh, beautiful. 
He ends this chapter with a list of 77 graces and fruits to be derived from attend devout attendance at Holy Mass. And really, the burden of the rest of the book is going to be just to work through uh, some of these 77 or to kind of lump them together. Let me just point out, if you're wondering, what's this deal with like listing all the fruits that come from the Mass and the Eucharist? Well, flip open the Catechism to page 1391. And um, now it's not a list of 77. But in 1391, the Catechism says... Uh, the fruits of Holy Communion. Then it's going to it's gonna lump the, basically all 77 are basically lumped together here. Our, it augments our, our Holy Communion augments our relationship with Christ, our union with him. It separates us from sin, wipes away venial sins, preserves us from future mortal sins, builds up unity in the body of Christ, commits us to the poor, and um, uh, deepens our unity with other, other Christians. So, it's a thing where we talk about what the Eucharist um, does. Um, and, um, you know, when Jesus says, if you eat my body and drink my blood, you'll have life in you. These are, th there's different aspects to what the Eucharist produces in us. And there's just so many uh, here. Um, again, I think they're summed up in the catechism pretty well. You'll see a big emphasis on they bring salvation and healing. They bring us into this perfect worship, th uh, into thanksgiving, uh, forgiveness. Also, intercession for others that unites us to Christ in his intercession, communion with the saints, brings blessings, protection, and strength, all of which are participation in him, in him as our great high priest. And this is just enumerating what that means to say we're united to Christ as our great high priest. Nice little mic drop here on page 67. <laughs> After he lists all 77 effects of Holy Communion with the Eucharist and Jesus at Mass, he says... What do you think now of Holy Mass, O Christian? <laughs> um, but please notice, again, it's not magic. What you have here is, he, it's, he sent, he, he's doing this because he's trying to encourage us and the reader to know how to profit more fruitfully in Mass. That's why he says in the middle of 67, if, if Christians only knew how to profit from Holy Mass, they might acquire greater riches than are to be found in all things that God has created. Because it's Christ himself that's out there at Mass. Um, in other words, the intellect has to get involved. You have to use your intelligence to do the Old Testament typologies, to look at the what's happening in the, in the visible sacraments to understand through faith that the sacraments are there. Which, by the way, it's not just a pure, this is not just rationalism, because it's really the light of faith, trusting the Lord and trusting that he's instituted these sacraments, uh, especially the Mass, uh, for our salvation. And faith isn't just the intellect, an illumination of the intellect, it also requires the will. That's why Thomas Aquinas says that makes faith a unique use of the will because, because it involves trust and you can't like force somebody to trust you, that faith also involves the will because you say, I love you, so I'm going to choose freely to think a certain way. You, that's why I think John Henry Newman said, um, faith is the reasoning of a religious mind. And because it involves God, it always gonna, is always gonna require an act of trust vis-a-vis -vis, uh, love. Okay, great. Anyway, that's chapter three. If you want to take a pause right now, I think I can do chapter four quicker than that. Uh, go ahead and take a pause right now if you want to. And then let's meet back here. Let's meet back here in five minutes for uh, chapter four. All right, did you hit the pause button? Well, if you hit the pause button, welcome back. If you didn't, we're just going to keep rolling. Chapter four, now we're getting into what are the mysteries that are there at Mass? And I think it's worth doing this, really going through this in detail in these next several chapters because it'll help you at certain moments in the Mass to, to, to through faith, understand what's coming to us, the mysteries of Christ coming to us through the, um, the visible mystery, the visible things happening at Mass. Uh, the, chap the chapter title is, In the Holy Mass, Christ Renews His Incarnation. You may be wondering, okay, what is all, it's going to come up a lot. Christ is, is renewing his incarnation. He's renewing his nativity. He's renewing his cross. He's renewing his resurrection. Is that just some kind of sentimental thing? Keep in mind, everything we said in chapter three about through the, through the power of the epiclesis, calling down the Holy Spirit, Christ renewing in the sense of making present and making effective. So for example, on the, the cross happens once in history. But now it's through the non-bloody signs and symbols of 
of the church, Christ will work to apply those mysteries and their effects to actual human beings. Um, he'll use later in this chapter, I'll get, I'll get out of order here, I'll use the, the analogy of a bank. So it's like in, in the, the cross and resurrection of Jesus, this work of redemption, all the healing of the human being and all of the cosmos, he makes this massive deposit in this heavenly treasure. I mean, Jesus himself used this image of treasure in heaven. But it's through the life of the church, especially the sacraments and the mass, where these withdrawals are taken out and the money is spent, so to speak, on us. Um, ritual, keep in mind too, ritual. This reminds you of some of the things I said in chapter one. Rituals aren't just religious things. Human beings do rituals all the time. And what rituals do are they're tangible things that make present an invisible thing. For example, just take a handshake. So this is like so human stuff. This is not like some weird thing. I know I'm, I've been using fancy Greek words, but when you do a handshake with someone, depending on the context, that you know, putting your hand in someone else's hand and squeezing it and moving it up and down, that can symbolize an agreement or friendship. But it, but putting a hand in someone else's hand and squeezing it, moving it up and down, is not friendship. It's a hand and another hand moving up and down but it can symbolize it because it's like the two are now in contact. So it symbolizes your unity and it can actually make the friendship or the, or the agreement happen. It can actually deepen it and make the friendship um, present or make the agreement um, consummated, so to speak. So uh, think about a, a, a flag. Is the United States red, white, and blue? No, it's a giant country, but a flag symbolizes it. In a certain way, when the flag is present, you might say the country, the invisible thing of the United States of America and all these people and all these institutions is somehow manifest there. How about a meal? If mom and dad and kids get together and all this food and, and like they, you know, they're just, they're in the ki kitchen and the table and the chairs and they're all there and they're having this meal. That meal symbolizes that they're a family and in eating the same food, they're literally being built up of the same stuff. Like they're literally eating the same food. So their bodies are becoming one body made of the same stuff. That's what it means to be one body. So even a meal is a kind of ritual. If you don't believe me with that, just try like turning your chair around and facing the other direction. All of a sudden the whole thing starts to fall apart. Or um, tell Aunt, uh, Aunt uh, Berta that you don't like her food and you're gonna eat McDonald's. It's not gonna go well, the, the meal's gonna break down and it's gonna hurt the family. So that's just a, a human analogy to help us understand what all this renewal stuff is. Um, I talked about the more the theology of it bef before uh, in chapter three, but just keep that in mind. You've got an, an invisible thing, which is real. Again, it's Christ's life, his death, his resurrection. It's things that are real, they've really happened and they're these real events that now abide in God. And then through these specific gestures that he himself has given us that can grow and develop in life of the church, that these mysteries are gonna be made present, symbolized, and then actually happen. Okay, so you can almost anticipate now what the next several chapters are gonna be. So in the Holy Mass, Christ renews his incarnation. What's the incarnation? It's the, it's the enfleshment of God. The second person of the Trinity who is God, God the Son, incarnates, goes into flesh, meaning taking to himself a human nature, assuming a human nature, to himself. How does that happen in the mass? Well, in different in different ways, he's going to focus especially on the um, the offertory or the um, and the consecration. So, for example, let's let make sure I'm on the I don't want to jump around too much. Um, so, on page seventy two, he says he holds nothing um, prior to the consecration. He holds nothing but a priest of bread. But as soon as he pronounces the words of consecration. Uh, at that same moment, the host is changed by divine power into the true body of Christ. And then he'll, he'll speak later about how that's, imagine Mary um, holding Christ in her womb. He's taken flesh. How? By the power of the word of God. Christ is the word or logos of God. And through the calling down of the Holy Spirit on her, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, she holds him in her womb. Now that, that mystery is being symbolized by the priest holding in his hands the body of Christ. Do you see how it symbolizes it? But more than that, through the calling down of the Holy Spirit, the event of her holding his enfleshed 
body, the enfleshed God, through the power of the Holy, same Holy Spirit, that event which abides in heaven now is made present in a sacramental way in the, in the Eucharist. Really key little thing where he says here, as soon as he pronounces the words of consecration, remember he's writing this book about 50 years after the Council of Trent, which was trying to respond to Martin Luther and other Protestant reformers who were attacking the notion that the, the, bo- the bread and wine become the, um, the body and blood of Christ. Uh, what we call transubstantiation, the full conversion of the substance of bread and wine into the substance of Christ himself. The Council of Trent says, I think it's in the 12th or 13th session on, on the Eucharist, but I, I don't know which session, but I know Trent said that it's that this change comes about v verborum. In Latin, that means through the words. What words? On one level, it's the words that the, that the priest says, and that's what um, Father von Kokum is going to point out, the power of the priest to, to, to do this. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. You can see that on, on page uh, 74. Um, it's the authority of priests to speak efficacious words. At the, uh, uh, you can see he didn't give this power to angels, but it's through the power that, um, of the, the priest. Um, if I learned this from, from Bishop Barron. If that seems strange to you, that words can have so much power, even on a human level, just think if, if someone ha- is a, has a duly uh, authorized authority, they can actually, in certain contexts, do things just by speaking it. Remember uh, an umpire in a baseball game? If he says, you're out, you're actually out in the framework of the game. The words do it. Before you weren't out, when he said, you're out, you're out. Um, when police say you're under arrest, because he's a duly authoritative deputy of the community, you're actually under arrest. It's, but the saying of the words is what actually does it. When parents say you're grounded, guess what? Even if you sneak out of the house, you're literally grounded because they're your duly appointed parents. Now, who's Christ? He is the duly appointed son of God. He's the word of God. So his word has authority over all creation. And it can reach down to the, you might say, the deepest roots of what a thing is, the substance of a thing. And when he speaks it, it's true. Because his word is the, not describing what's true, but causing things to be true. Uh, He's the word through whom all things exist, like we hear in uh, St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. So when Christ says, this is my body, it's his body. Because he has the authority to, uh, to say that. Again, it's not a magic trick. It's a question of a framework and authority to speak into that framework. And his framework is, is um, s- the substantial beings in, um, in creation. Uh, you can see this kind of gesture too in on, uh, paragraph 1375 of the Catechism. Okay. 1375. Okay, here it is. It is by the conversion of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood that Christ becomes present in this sacrament. The church fathers strongly affirmed the faith of the church in the efficacy of the word of Christ and the action of the Holy Spirit to bring about this conversion. I'm just going to quote St. John Chrysostom and St. Ambrose. And then it'll, I guess, no surprise here, it'll, it'll quote the Council of Trent speaking about how the, the effect that this word does in terms of transubstantiation. Notice it's the word, Christ himself, um, and speaking human words at the Last Supper, and then the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's, it's the two together which bring about the, the body of Christ. Okay, so uh, that's why uh, Catholics hold so dear the words of consecration over the bread and wine. When the priest says it, it's, it's, it's through the nonviolent speaking of those words that the change, the substantial change uh, comes about. And, but it's not simply the priest's own eye, um, this is my body. Uh, it's, it's, he's, he's speaking in the person of Christ because it's Christ's body. That, that's who the eye refers to. Wonderful thing here, 74 and 75, how much we should just rejoice in this because you know that's the moment. There's more that's gonna happen in the Eucharistic prayer in terms of the offering and the, the call, um, asking for certain things. But there is a particular way in which at that moment, there should just be a real joy because Christ is present uh, sacramentally. Um, you know, what I want to point out to, before we get down to chapter four here, is go back to page 70, because there can be some confusion that can come up, 
either with Catholics or with non-Catholics when they, when they hear this stuff. It, and it has to do with what we call a mode or a, uh, a way. Um, so at the bottom of page 70, take a look at this. Uh, he says, uh, this is confirmed by Venerable Alanis de Rupe, that's Alan de la Roche. He was a um, 15th century theologian. Loved, he had great writings on prayer, but um, he says this. As, as I once became man at the sound of the angelics, this is uh, words that he kind of imagines Jesus saying. As I once became man at the sound of the angelic salutation, right, the word of God spoken to the angel, he becomes flesh in the womb of the virgin. So in each mass, I again become man after a sacramental manner. That is absolutely uh, huge. So it doesn't mean Jesus is born again as like a little zygote, fetus, embryo, et cetera, et cetera okay? I think I got the order there wrong. It's, it's the mystery of his incarnation in the womb of the virgin is made present in a different way. One way to think about this, one way to think about this is the what and the who is the same. The what is Christ himself. The who is of Christ himself. The what is his incarnation in this case but the how is different. Okay, so how was it first? It was through the great mystery of the Holy Spirit, the angel Gabriel, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it's it's in her her womb. In the mass, how how is it? What's the manner or the mode? The same who, the same what, the how is sacramental. I mean, this is pure Thomas Aquinas, and Thomas is really the great genius on this. When he talks about, well, what do you mean sacrament? It means via a sign. Same who, same what, but via a sign. An example maybe that helps me to understand this is, okay, you can be in a room with your spouse, and your spouse is physically present to you, but can you get a phone call from your spouse? Yeah, so you could say your spouse is present present to you via the telephone call, or you get a text message, but from your your spouse, and you say, "Who, who is that?" Well, it's my spouse. <laughs> That's not my spouse. <laughs> By the way, that reminds me of a hilarious uh, Saturday Night Live episode, a uh, uh, short where this guy's singing a song. It's called "Throw It on the Ground," where someone says, hands him a cell phone, and says, "It's your dad," and he says, "That's not my dad," and he throws the cell phone on the ground. <laughs> it's this key distinction: same who, but in a different way. Does my dad look like a cell phone? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Does Jesus look like a small white wafer? No, that's ridiculous. But that is your dad present to you via a text message. So you look at your phone and say, oh my, it's my dad, it's my dad. And then you engage with him through the cell phone. The sacraments work like that. There, there's a, a tangible reality and, and we're meant to see through faith and say, oh, J Jesus is working. Is, is that, this is his presence. Now, the presence is going to itself uh, be in different ways. For example, in confession, the sacrament of reconciliation, it's his, he's present via his forgiveness. Baptism, he's present via his regenerating and uh, forgiving authority. But in the Eucharist, he's present in a, um, in a different way, what, what we call a, a substantial way, which I think he actually gets into here uh, later on. But that's just absolutely key. And sometimes um, sometimes Catholics are a little bit nervous about saying what Father von Kochum is saying here, which is that the mystery of Christ is present. His, the actual mystery, in this case of his nativity, in the consecration, his, his body, his blood, his soul, his divinity, the crucified, risen Lord, there he's, there he's present. But, to, but, we'd never, but we wouldn't say that's not a sacramental way. That's where people can say weird things like, Hey, Father, can you please turn on the air conditioner because Jesus is going to get really hot in the tabernacle? Or don't chew him with your teeth because you're going to crunch him up in little bones. He, he's fully present there via a sacrament. And in this particular sacrament, what you have is the full conversion of the bread and wine into himself. What remains is the mystery of Christ himself under the mere appearances of bread and wine. So in the case of the Eucharist, it's the the appearance of bread and the appearance of wine, which remains, no actual bread, no actual wine, and Christ is under that. We, we wouldn't say Jesus turns into a piece of bread. That is totally absurd. Um, but rather he, in this very strange conversion of substances or elevation, changing of a substance where it's the bread and wine no longer remain, but the mere appearances, through the power of his word, he gives himself to us to be present to us 
and to participate um, in his cross and resurrection. So in this case, we'd say that the, 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 what appears to be bread and wine are mere symbols, meaning there's no substantial reality. They're just merely outward appearances. The other sacraments don't work quite the same way, like there's actual water and baptism. Um, okay, so, but to say a, a sacrament or the Eucharist in particular is a symbol in this sense is not to denigrate the, the absolute real presence of Christ in it. Because we're not saying in this case, oh, there's bread and wine and there's Jesus. There's no bread, there's no wine. It's Christ himself. Present, vi verborum, through his power of his word, in an abiding way, um, in a sacramental way. Got it? Okay. Like one time I heard, I heard someone teaching in the Catholic faith, I will not name this person, and the person said, Jesus is present in the Eucharist the same way he's present in heaven. And that's actually imprecise and incorrect. He's present in heaven in his glorified body. He's present on earth vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, uh, sacramentally. But that doesn't, that's not a denigration. That's not a downgrade. It's the same what, but a different way. You can remember, um, remember the different ways we can communicate with each other just as an analogy. Okay, great. He ends this chapter with a thing about the Eucharistic miracle. And, um, you know, Eucharistic miracles can point us to the mystery there, but they also can be kind of strange. And I, <laughs> this priest kind of sees the baby Jesus somehow present there in the Eucharist, and then he eats him and then passes, he eats the Eucharist and passes out. My note here says I, I would pass out too if I ate a baby. Um, it's actually a great mercy in some ways to us that we don't see Christ whole and entire in his glory in the Eucharist. We see what appears to be bread and wine. But that's, again, to quote Thomas Aquinas, that's um, he, propter homin, as he would say. It's proper, it's appropriate to us to encounter Christ that way, which requires faith um, and love. Okay, but the point of that, I think the point of that beautiful little story there with that little strange thing, the baby Jesus there, um, is that he swoons away and fell into an ecstasy of love, which is meant to happen on some spiritual level all the time. Where the catechism says we're meant to get a foretaste of the heavenly Jerusalem. Um it might not overwhelm us emotionally. It's not, the Eucharist is not meant to produce some kind of like wild enthusiasm um, or running up and down the aisles of the church, but it is meant to give us a foretaste through faith, working through the sacraments of, of joy, a foretaste of heaven itself. The a fancy, a theological name for that is um, the, uh, uh, the anticipated eschatology. We anticipate the glory of heaven. We get a little foretaste of that. So where is the nativity of Jesus? How is it made present or renewed in the, in the mass, especially in the consecration um, when he takes flesh? Because later in the Eucharist prayer, he'll be offered and that'll, that'll, that'll renew his offering on the cross. And we'll, 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 we'll go through more parts of the mass in the future chapters. I want to add for my own, um, you know, no, no extra charge for this. There's another way in which the, the incarnation of Christ is made present when he takes a human nature. And I think that's just the way the mass begins with the priest walking in procession through the nave of the church. Because the nave of the church always symbolizes heaven. Nave means boat, navel, boat. This world, we're traveling through the waters of this world. The sanctuary, the holy place, symbolizes heaven. So in this life, we're traveling through earth on the boat of the church towards the holy place of heaven. So in his, so Christ doesn't offer himself, he offers himself in the sanctuary of heaven, right? On the cross and eternally when he ascends into heaven. Our great high priest, like letter of the Hebrew says. But he begins... In earth. I mean, that's the incarnation. He comes down in earth. So the priest shows up and he's clothed in these priestly garments, but he doesn't start in the sanctuary. He starts in the nave and he moves through the nave. That symbolizes Christ's incarnation moving through his life. And then he goes up to the, the place of sacrifice, the cross, which is both the cross and heaven all at the same uh, time. So, so the mass itself begins with reminding us that Jesus comes into our humanity, our earthly life, and then offers our, all of our, our human nature on the, the cross. So lots of other ways the, uh, uh, the incarnation of Christ is present. But I think those are the two main ways. The priest's procession through the nave and then the, the, uh, the words of consecration, calling down the Holy Spirit, the words of Christ making himself present under sacramental signs, um, present there. Uh, similar to how he was present in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he would emerge from the womb and finally teach, preach, do miracles, offer himself, and we'll see that in the coming chapters. And in the mass, it's the words of the priest, Christ sacramentally in the hands of the priest, um, present among us to be our great high priest.
priest. Next time, let's try chapter five and six. Maybe I can get through three chapters. Um, but thanks for joining me for uh, part two of this series. God bless you.